Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Merle Massey. I am the coordinator for undergraduate research here at the University of Saskatchewan. One of the programs that I run is the SURE program, Student Undergraduate Research Experience. And uh, this session today is what you need to know about intellectual property or IP. And this is part of the entrepreneurship series that has been uh, brought into the SURE program from Research Excellence and Innovation. Thank you for so much for this uh, entrepreneurship series. And today we have John Mapletoft, who is the the tech transfer manager over at REI. And with that, John, I'm going to pass it directly over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Merle. And we'd also like to thank uh, Sure for, for having us uh, here. Um, so my name's John. Uh, I have a background in life sciences. As I started finishing my graduate work, um, I started to realize that um, there's not enough positions in academia for all the, the graduate students and graduate work. So that's when I started to get more interested in the business side of things. And that led me to do a business internship and then from there go work for a startup company and then uh, uh, a few other positions over the years. And then I ended up back at the university in the tech transfer office. So that's a little bit about me. And what I'd like to talk to people today is what you need to know about IP, kind of from a university perspective. Um, so here's the kinds of things we're going to go through today. And uh, I think my goal would be that uh, if any of these sections are new to you, you gain some awareness about, about them. Uh, we're not all going to become experts in, in one hour. And then anything that you are familiar with, maybe you learn one or two new things about it. So that's my goal. So, so the things we're going to talk about, we'll first talk about what is intellectual property. We'll go through several types of intellectual property, and then we're going to do a deep dive on patents. Patents are, are probably one of the more common or more important um, types of intellectual property at universities. And that's because patents allow you to protect things while simultaneously telling the world about them. So, of course, we're at a university. We want to publish our research. We want to shout it from the rooftops, tell people what we're working on, tell people what we've discovered. Um, that doesn't really uh, uh, mesh well with secret secrecy, but it meshes really well with patents because one of the things you have to do when you file a patent is you have to disclose uh, what uh, uh, that patent is about. You have to give up all the details on your invention. So further on to patents, we're going to talk about what makes someone an inventor on a patent. We'll go through a typical prote protection pathway that universities follow. We'll talk about assignment of ownership. Um, the formal process of invention reporting to the university. And we'll also talk about something called public disclosure, which is when you make your, your invention known to the public. Uh, and then finally, we'll, we'll spend a, a bit of time talking about licensing. License agreements are the mechanism by which uh, intellectual property is transacted between organizations. So we'll, we'll do a bit of a dive on that. And then hopefully leave a little bit of time at the end for uh, questions and discussion, if there's any to be had. So just a quick disclaimer, IP laws do vary a little bit from country to country. There's been a lot of attempts over the, the past few decades to kind of harmonize laws amongst uh, uh, the different countries that, that are often doing business together. But uh, so what we're going to talk about today, we'll probably cover most countries, particularly Western countries. But you may encounter situations that don't precisely fit with what we're with what we're talking about. Especially if you're working this area for a long period of time. So first of all, what is intellectual property? Most countries define it as creations of the intellect for which a monopoly is granted by law. It's a legal property. And uh, um, just like other legal properties, you think about real estate as being a, a type of legal property, um, certain rights are conferred by law. So in the case of intellectual property, it's mostly the right to exclude others from practicing it. And these rights are transferable. So they can be bought, sold, exchanged, etc. Um, one of the uh, uh, unique things about intellectual, uh, intellectual property, though, is the rights are usually limited in some way. There's usually some limit made on them, whereas, whereas if you own your house, you own your house and you own it indefinitely or until you sell it. Uh, with a patent, for example, 
there's a 20 year patent life. You get that monopoly, you get that ability to exclude others from practicing it, but only for 20 years. And at the end of that 20 year period, now anyone can use that uh, invention. So here's the, the types of IP we're gonna talk about. Uh, for the moment, we're gonna gloss right over patents which cover inventions. And we're gonna come back and do a much deeper dive on those. When we skip over those, we're gonna talk about, very briefly about copyrights, which cover creative works, uh, trademarks, which cover names, signs, designs, expressions, logos uh, associated with businesses, and uh, trade secrets, which uh, um, as the name implies, covers secret information. So first of all, copyrights. Um, copyrights cover original, uh, creative works that are, are fixed in a medium, okay? So it's not just enough to have an idea about uh, a bunch of uh, uh, wizard children that uh, they go to a wizard school and they have wizard adventures. Um, that's not enough. But if you write down 10 stories about those wizard children, you give them all names and, and uh, you write those down, that is now fixed in the, the literature medium. And then you have a copyright on that. Uh, and so, of course, here's some examples here, uh, books, um, uh, movies, dance choreography, uh, songs, paintings, drawings, photos, even software code. The written component of software code um, is all covered by uh, copyright. Um, an interesting aspect of copyright is that it's granted automatically upon creation, even if it's incomplete. So this means as soon as you start putting pen to paper, you have a copyright on your work. And you can advertise to others that you're claiming the copyright. This isn't necessary, but you can do this to tell others you're claiming your copyright by using the copyright symbol, that's the, the circle with a C in it, and the year the work was created in your name. Uh, further to that, you don't have to do this, but you can register it with a government IP office. And this just really provides evidence of creation. So let's imagine you, uh, you, uh, you do write a, a novel, uh, and you want to shop it around to different uh, publishers and you you send it to a bunch of different publishers, you never hear anything back. Next thing you know, you see a copy of your book with someone else's name on it in the store and uh, uh, you go back and, and you show that you registered it and, and left a copy with the government IP office uh, five years ago and that shows that you created the work uh, before uh, the other person that that maybe attempted to steal it from you so that's that's the benefit of registering your copyright though it's not necessary and copyright lasts for a long time it is limited but it lasts for a number of years after the creator's death and um, i'm not sure where this is at right now i want to say maybe 70 years or something like that in in many countries and i, I kind of put a blank here i put an x and the reason for this people call this the the disney rule is every time Walt Disney's uh, copyrights are about to expire. And I think Walt Disney died uh, in, the, in the 1960s. Um, the Disney company, along with a lot of other major entertainment companies that have uh, uh, similar things going on, they lobby governments to get copyright extended. So right now it's, it's something like um, 70, 75 years after the creator's death, but I, I fully expect that it will uh, um, continue to get extended as companies like Disney continue to lobby for longer copyright protection terms. Trademarks, on the other hand, uh, cover recognizable names, logos, designs that identify uh, uh, commercial products or services. In a lot of countries, you get your trademark just by using it. So if I open a business, I open a bakery, I call it John's Bakery, um, I can potentially have my trademark just by doing that. Um, Similar to the copyright symbol, if I want to advertise to others that I'm claiming a trademark to that, I can just put the trademark symbol, the, the superscript TM symbol, and I don't have to do anything in order to use that. All I have to do is write that TM. Um, on the other hand, just like copyright, you can register your trademark with government offices. There's fees involved. It's, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred dollars or something like that. That allows you to use the registered trademark symbol. So uh, in this case, that would be the, the circle with the R in it. You can only use this symbol if you register your trademark with a government IP office. Uh, the limitation for trademarks is it's a use it or lose it system. As long as you're continuously using your trademark, you keep it. If you stop using it, if you go out of business, if you put your business on pause, 
um, if you have a product that you stop selling, you could potentially lose the trademark. But again, as long as you use it continuously, uh, there's no term on protection. You can think about, there. there's many examples of companies that have been around for a um, hundred years or longer and still have trademarks on, on their name and, and the names of some of their products and services. So trade secrets, on the other hand, this is probably uh, the least commonly used type of IP at universities, just again, because we're not very good at secrecy. We, we like to share with the world what we're working on. So that doesn't, that's not very compatible with trade secrets, but just understand a little bit about it. Trade secrets cover information, things like uh, formulas, best practices, processes, methods, um, designs, patterns, compilations, data compilations, uh, client lists, different things like that. One of the key things is trade secrets must confer economic benefit to uh, uh, the business that has that trade secret. They also have to demonstrate that they are trying to keep it secret. That can be things like uh, um, keeping information under lock and key, in a locked safe, password protected, uh, within the company only allowing people that need to know uh, that information have access to it, and and you may have to demonstrate that in order to have it be considered a trade secret. The protection for trade secrets is a little bit different. It's it's more related to the legal threat for inappropriate use. So kind of the legal consequences someone might face if they if they stole a trade secret or violated a confidentiality agreement. Um, and one of the interesting things is that as long as it's kept secret. Uh, there's no term on protection. So you think about things like uh, um, the Coca-Cola formula or the 11 herbs and spices uh, of uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and those have been kept trade secrets for, for probably 100 years or more, and uh, they still have some level of protection over those secrets because they've uh, maintained them so. So just a note on, on trademarks and secrets, and and uh, this is sometimes a better strategy than patenting. We're, of course, going to come back and talk about patenting in more detail now. But particularly in things like nutrition, consumer products, food. Um, and uh, uh, an example I like to talk about uh, that was actually developed at a university is Gatorade. This was developed at the University of Florida College of Medicine in the 1960s for uh, uh, their football team, the Florida Gators. So that's how they came up with the name Gatorade. So uh, in, they could have filed a patent, but remember the 20 year patent life the patent on that formula would have expired sometime in the 80s. Instead, they trademark the name and uh, keep the formula secret. So this works really well for food products because you have to publish the ingredient list, but not the exact amounts or the process you use to make it. So that's why um, uh, trademarks and, and trade secrets work really well for these types of uh, uh, products. So, uh, I like to talk about Coke a lot because they have a lot of examples of intellectual property. We're gonna talk more about patents in a, in, a, in a minute here, but I mean, you could have a patent on the function of the bottle cap. If you had a brand new bottle cap that worked differently, the function of that could be patented. Uh, Coke indeed does have trademarks on not only their name and logo, but even the shape of their bottle, they have a, a trademark on. So no one else is allowed to use that iconic uh, bottle shape. Um, without infringing um, on Coke's trademark. Uh, and then again, they have a trade secret on the formula that they've maintained for um, you know, 100 or more years now. And I have, I've got, I have a bit of a question down here, and we've already kind of talked about this, but is it better to have a, uh, a patent or a trade secret for a formula? And it depends precisely what the formula is. But remember that if you patent it, you do have complete protection. You don't have to worry about keeping it secret but that patent expires after uh, 20 years. Whereas if, if it's something that you can keep secret, you can have that trade secret in perpetuity. So that's something to think about. Okay, so let's dive deeper on patents. And again, patents are the ones probably we most commonly use or, or are often interested in, in at um, universities. And they, they protect inventions. Inventions are things that do something, they have a function. Um, the four classic types of inventions are compositions, uh, methods, devices, or processes. So these are things that do something. Again, it's it's a it's a limited legal um, monopoly for 20 years, and 
And what you have to do in order to get a patent is you have to give up all your secrets. You have to tell the world exactly how your invention works. And in exchange for that, you get the 20 year monopoly on it. And um, the governments that came up with patenting systems, the whole idea was people were keeping things secret. It was stifling innovation. And they realized a way that they could get people to give up all their secrets to, to help advance innovation was as long as you tell us exactly how your invention works, we'll let you have a limited time monopoly on it. Now, something interesting about patents, they're a right to exclude others from practicing the invention, but they're actually not a right to practice the invention. You can have a patent on something, you can go and stop others from infringing your patent legally, but you may not even be able to practice the invention in your own patent. So I know this seems a little bit weird, but I'll, I'll give you a, a, a very simple example. <clears throat> so let's go way back in time. Let's imagine uh, uh, we had patenting systems, you know, going back hundreds of years and um, someone invents a three-legged chair. The very first chair, no one's ever had a chair before. Um, before the invention of this chair, people either had to stand or lie down. There was nothing in between. Someone comes along and invents a three-legged chair. They get a patent on it. It's a tremendous success. It's super valuable. It allows people to sit. They can sit and talk, sit and work, sit and read, do all sorts of things they would either have to previously stand or lay down to do. The only problem with the three-legged chair is it's quite prone to flipping over uh, and, and uh, it was a bit of a safety hazard. Someone else comes along, they realize that they can greatly improve this three-legged chair, make it much safer if they add a fourth leg to it. And they can do that and they can run off and file a, a patent on this improvement. Um, one of the interesting things about this, as you can imagine, uh, you've got this patent now on this four-legged chair. All four-legged chairs also happen to have at least three legs. So even though you've got this patent on this four-legged chair, you are unable to practice it because you, you violate the three-legged chair patent. So hopefully that illustrates how a patent is a right to exclude others from practicing the invention, but it's not necessarily a right to practice your invention if your invention uh, happens to infringe upon other patents that it improved upon. So just a note uh, on the difference between inventions and discoveries. Um, inventions are patentable, discoveries are not. So the difference here, discoveries are new knowledge, whereas inventions are applications of new knowledge. Inventions have to do something. They can't just be a fact. They have to be, they have to be a device or a composition that does something. So for example, in the life sciences, if you uh, figure out the cause of a disease, that would be a discovery. But if you develop a brand new molecule that dis that disrupts a disease, that could be an invention. That molecule is the thing that does something. So it's not just knowledge, it is an application of that knowledge to do something. So that's a, a criteria for being an invention. There's a, a few other criteria for an invention to be patentable. It has to be new, it can't be something that's already out in the public domain. So um, you think about the the, implications on this for, for publishing, you can't uh, patent something that's already been published. So whether it's something that other people have published or sometimes people accidentally um, publish their own stuff too early before they file a patent application. So they've made uh, uh, their invention no longer new by publishing it. So it has to basically be secret up until um, you file the patent application. It has to be useful. Of course, at universities, it's it's that this criteria isn't usually a problem for us. We tend to work on um, problems that the world has, so almost everything we come up with is is useful in some way. So that's usually not a criteria that's that's difficult to uh, show. Uh, a criteria a criterion that is sometimes difficult to, to show is non obviousness. This is a bit of a weird one. We talk about things that, that they have to be non-obvious to experts in that area or those skilled in that art. And, and this is a bit of a strange concept, but what it, what it means is you're not just looking at the literature. You take this paper over here and this paper over here and you just slap them together. One plus one equals two. No, that's too obvious. There has to be something unexpected, unusual about the, about the results, about the experiments and, and data you get. 
Uh, so uh, a classic example of that would be synergy. So you would expect that if you combine two things, you would get a simple additive effect, um, a one plus one equals two situation. But if you combine two things and instead of just getting an additive effect, you get a, a synergistic effect, you get one plus one equals three, that's uh, potentially non-obvious. And that's that's probably the most common thing we see at, at universities is um, things work even better than you might expect them to. And that can make an invention uh, uh, non-obvious. The final criterion is inventions must be reduced to practice. They have to work. You have to have a working prototype. You have to have data that shows that this can work. It can't just be an idea in your head. You have to show it. Okay, next let's talk about inventorship. Inventorship is interesting because it's defined by law. Um, and what the law says is someone must contribute to the to coming up with the idea for the invention uh, or overcoming key challenges, uh, contributing to problem solving and getting it to work. So just because you work on something doesn't make you an inventor, particularly if you're just following uh, instructions, just because you paid for it, just because it wouldn't have happened with you, just because you managed the team or put the team together, again, doesn't make you an inventor. You have to be part of the group that comes up with the idea or overcomes key challenges in getting it to work. Uh, another note here that's particularly relevant at universities, academic authorship does not necessarily equal inventorship. Um, so again, sometimes someone might say, well, you know, so-and-so worked really hard on this. I'd really like to make them an inventor. Uh, you're not allowed to do that. They, they legally have to uh, uh, participate in coming up with the idea or solving the challenges. And this is very important to get right because Incorrect inventorship is, is a way to get a patent invalidated. And it's not just maybe a disgruntled potential inventor who really thinks they should have been on a patent and they were left off. Uh, that certainly can happen and that can be a problem for a patent. But, but the other thing is someone that has nothing to do with the patent, say a competitor with a, a, a similar but different product, if they find out that maybe an inventor was left off or an extra inventor was put in, uh, they could get the patent invalidated. So something, someone who has nothing to do with the patent could use this information to get the, the patent invalidated. So it's really important to get it right. And just this final uh, point here, inventorship is not the same as ownership. Uh, remember that intellectual property rights can be bought, sold, et cetera. So not always, but generally speaking, uh, inventors uh, can be the initial owners of intellectual property, but and someone will always remain the inventor, uh, even if the patent is uh, transacted somewhere else, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the owner of the patent. Okay, so why patent things? I mean, one of the obvious reasons people probably think about is let's make some money. Let's make some big bucks off our patent. And um, indeed at the University of Saskatchewan, in exchange for their inventive contributions, U of S inventors get 50% of net revenue realized from their inventions. But even if you don't care about the money, um, there's another reason you might consider patenting. And, and that is that the patenting can actually be the best way to get your invention out into the world. Um, it's a bit counterintuitive because you sometimes assume, what if I just gave it away for free? Wouldn't that be the best way to get it out into the world? And, and really it depends what it is. If you just if you discover a new use for an existing drug, the drug is out there, it's cheap, it's easily accessible. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe you are better off just publishing that, giving that information away rather than patenting it. But if if your thing is something new, something that requires you know field testing, clinical testing, um, manufacturing, manufacturing to scale, being able to manufacture thousands, millions of units if it's gonna require uh, uh, distribution and sales teams to get it out into the world, um, that's something that, that an individual or a university really doesn't have the capacity to do. So what you need to do is you need to attract investment, you need to attract partnership, often from big companies. And if big companies are gonna take a risk on developing a new product, they're gonna say, what's in it for me? And if you have a patent, you can tell them as well, for 20 years, you're gonna be the only one that's allowed to sell this. So that is the incentive you provide to the partners that are required to get your invention to market. So again, even if you want to give it away for free, uh, it, it 
patenting still could be valuable to you in getting your invention out there to help people, particularly if a lot of investment is required uh, uh, to get it there. Okay, so now we'll start talking a little bit about the uh, typical protection pathway we, fo we follow here at U of S and indeed other universities follow uh, similar things. We're gonna talk about some of these underlying terms in more detail, but um, over a period of months, we start talking with inventors. Uh, we have them report their invention to us and assign it to us. Uh, our office then evaluates and decides if it can be patented and commercialized. We'll do a patentability analysis. Remember those four patent uh, criteria to make sure that something actually can be patented. And then we'll also make sure we can identify a market for it. And, and really, it, if something's patentable and we can identify a market, we almost always move ahead with patenting it. And notice these first two steps, uh, we haven't spent any, any uh, money yet. But now when we start to file patents, this is where we have costs. And one, one of the nice things about uh, the university is the inventors don't have, have to pay any of these costs. The university pays these costs. So we us usually do, what we, we file something called a US United States provisional patent application. Uh, this is kind of a placeholder application. It buys you a year before you have to finalize, uh, finalize the um, invention. This costs you know, around $10,000. And what we try to do is we try to synchronize it with the first public disclosure. Uh, we'll come back and talk about public disclosure in a minute, but this is where the invention no longer is new. So we time it with you're submitting a paper, you're submitting an abstract uh, um, uh, to a, a conference, uh, there's a poster day you're presenting at, you're giving a public seminar. That's what we try to time the first patent filing right before that so that we get the patent filed before your uh, invention becomes public knowledge. So again, that lasts for about a year. We then convert it to something called a patent cooperation treaty application. This can cost another 10,000 or so. Again, uh, when working with the university, the university pays these costs. And that this lasts for another one and a half years. You might hear some people call this a world patent not really a world patent. There's no such thing as a world patent, but it is kind of a world patent application. Basically, as long as you have a PCT in effect, your patent application is valid worldwide. Now, uh, here at the end of this one and a half years, so this is now two and a half years we've had a patent application, that's when your, your patent application stops being worldwide and you have to nationalize. This is where things get expensive. This is where you now have to choose which countries you want protection in. And it varies tremendously the cost from country to country. Um, a lot of things like if you have to translate to different languages, that can be very expensive. But just the rule of thumb is you're probably looking at tens of thousands of dollars per country. You can see how if you are going to uh, uh, a number of different countries, uh, it's gonna be quite expensive. So this isn't the only path, but it's kind of optimal in terms of maximizing early protection and either minimizing or deferring costs. And again, the university pays these early costs to buy us uh, uh, two and a half years. And really what we want to do in that two and a half year period is see if we can find an industrial partner uh, to come on and, and be a partner in the, in the technology. And uh, particularly if they're a well-established uh, mature company, uh, have them there to choose which countries we want to uh, continue the patent in and then have them pay those costs. And, and a lot of the time, if we don't have an industrial partner, by the time that PCT application expires, we either have to drop the patent or, or really curtail back where we want to protect. So this is just more of a graphical illustration. So again, uh, these are months along the green line in the middle here. So maybe six months ahead of time is a good time to start talking about an invention. Uh, finalize your invention report. We'll talk more about that in, in a, a few minutes. Maybe three months ahead of time, we'll do our patentability and, and uh, um, uh, market assessment. If we find it to be patentable and commercializable, we'll do that US provisional patent application at time zero. We'll time that with the first public disclosure. So the invention is no longer new, but we've already filed our application. So that's not a problem. Uh, 12 months later, convert it to a PCT application. Uh, that buys us another uh, year and a half. And again, 
what we're trying to do in that window is find an industrial partner that's going to uh, invest in the technology, help us advance it towards market, and uh, pay the patent costs for the territories they're interested in. Okay, we talked. Uh, we referred earlier a little bit to assignment of ownership. So this this literally means you are are giving ownership of your invention to uh, U of S. So you might ask, why would an inventor do this? Uh, and one one of the reasons is you might have to. So if you look at collective bargaining agreements, different policies at the university, uh, most employees and staff, most people that are being paid to be at the university uh, have to give ownership. The university owns their inventions if they use university resources to come up with them. But but there's other reasons as well. And, and um, I, I like to kind of convince people that, it, that it's worthwhile working with the university on their inventions. Um, you get you get a lot of support. You get the university to pay costs. You don't have to reach into your own pocket for tens of thousands of dollars to do the early protection on your universe on on your invention. And inventors still get 50% of net revenue realized from their invention. So um, they don't have to do necessarily any of the commercialization work. They don't have to spend on any of the costs. They really have zero risk to them. They keep their day job, uh, but they still have an opportunity to participate. Uh, if the invention uh, was to become wildly successful. We also referred earlier to invention reporting. This is the formal process by which you tell the university you have an invention. And in some ways it's never too early, but uh, a good rule of thumb is, is you know, six months you ex before you expect to submit that manuscript or, or abstract. Um, that gives uh, time for some back and forth on the invention report. Our invention report, it's not, it doesn't take very long to fill out, but um, there's a, sometimes some back and forth, sometimes the data are incomplete, sometimes you need to gather more data. Uh, a lot of times there's questions we need to ask and that can take you know several rounds of back and forth to complete that invention report. And then again, we need uh, ideally a few months to um, uh, complete market and patentability assessments and, and, and have our patent agents draft the patent application uh, uh, in time to have it ready before that first public disclosure. And we do have an invention report form template for this. So anyone that has an invention, uh, we can make that form accessible to them. And it's 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 not too onerous. It's mostly fill in the blank. It's nothing like a, a grant application. In fact, a lot of people uh, draw, uh, copy and paste things from grant applications into it. And uh, the idea is that it, it hopefully won't uh, take you that long to fill it out. It just m might require some back and forth discussion, maybe require some more data for the in uh, invention to be complete, that sort of thing. Okay, public disclosure. So we alluded to this a little bit. Of course, publication of a manuscript definitely would be public disclosure, but there's some other things to watch out for here. Um, early online publication. Um, it used to be that your manuscript would only appear in print. So until those journals shipped out from the factory, it was not considered publicly disclosed. But nowadays, uh, pretty much as soon as it's uh, um, completed the peer review process, it uh, gets published online early. Uh, another trend that we're seeing more and more of is uh, a publication during the review period. So again, we like to get our patents filed before um, something's even submitted to the journal. Uh, publication of, of abstracts as well. You go to a conference, you think uh, those conferences aren't published until the conference starts. Not true, a lot of the time the abstracts are published ahead of the conference, so something to be aware of. Um, putting things on websites, uh, PowerPoint presentations, uh, even student seminars. Um, really, you think about seminars at a university, unless it's behind locked doors where someone would have to show their ID uh, to get in, and even that, um, it's probably considered public disclosure. Casual conversation, if you go to a bar or restaurant, you start telling everyone about your invention before you file a patent application, that would likely make it not uh, patentable. Posters again, and something to remember, even local events, even U of S events usually uh, are public disclosure, so you need to have your, your patents filed ahead of that. Okay, so after we filed a patent, then what? So again, remember we want to find that industrial partner, um, and and we'll talk about licensing and how that works in in a minute here. But but how do we do this? So we definitely do some prospecting in uh, our office. 
uh, before uh, uh, COVID times, we would even go to conferences and, and take brief summaries of uh, the patents we have, the technologies we have under management and, and shop them around to companies. But we also find that a lot of the best connections for uh, uh, industrial partners and, and licensees come from the inventors themselves. So contacts they have, collaborators they've had, um, uh, collaborators that colleagues of them have had, people they meet at conferences. I like to tell people that you'll go to conferences and there'll be a bunch of uh, uh, sales people at, at tables trying to sell them stuff. But then then sometimes there will be uh, company presenters at the conference, the, the scientists at the company. Those are great contacts. Uh, and if someone's interested, uh, you can bring those contacts back and we can help uh, foster that relationship. Particularly if, if uh, for example, confidentiality agreements are required or if we get to the point of licensing the technology uh, to the company. And, and that's what we'll talk about next is licensing. Licensing is, is a common mechanism used to uh, uh, transact uh, the intellectual property between the university and company. But really anyone uh, can license uh, something. If they have something that's valuable and someone else wants to use it, really a license is just an agreement granting permission. So you think most of us are at least familiar with a driver's license. What is a driver's license? It's merely an agreement with the government granting you permission to operate uh, a motor vehicle in the, in the territory. So again, in this case, a license would be an agreement granting the company permission to use the university's intellectual property. And in exchange for this, the university and inventors get something back, usually royalty payments. So we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive. Um, I wouldn't expect anyone who's not familiar with this to, to get it all on the first, the first go here, but I just wanna raise awareness of some of the things that are considered in, in license agreements. If, if any of you do uh, startup companies and access technologies from, from universities to other places, you, you may need to go through this. So these are kind of the typical license agreement terms you'll see in a, in a university technology license. And, and we'll, we'll talk very briefly about each of them. Uh, field of use, grant, whether or not uh, the company can grant further sub, uh, sub licenses, uh, what territory it's valid in, how long the term, how long the agreement will last, who's gonna pay for patent costs. And remember for a university, it's really important to find a partner that's willing to pay for patent costs. Um, what compensation is coming back to the university? So again, royalties or, or compensation on the sub licenses. Something called change of control percentage, which would apply more for startups. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then things like milestones and upfront payments. So the way we're gonna go through these things, uh, oh, first of all, just, just a note of terminology, uh, the licensor is the party granting the license. So if the university is granting the license, they're the licensor. The licensee is the party receiving the license. So if the company is obtaining the technology from the university, they're the licensee. So the way we're gonna go through each of these, um, I've got kind of three scenarios, um, kind of a typical university license. At, uh, at USASC, we've actually moved to something we call a fast license system. We've got a simple, fast license template we try to use. And the idea there is instead of negotiating back and forth for months, we've tried to pick terms that we can live with, but are very friendly to the industry partner. The idea being there that uh, we wanna minimize fr friction. We want licenses to happen quickly. We want them to happen often. Uh, we don't wanna haggle over a, a small percent difference. We wanna get the technology advanced as quick as possible. And we feel that a way to do that is to be very friendly to the industry partner. So the three scenarios, uh, you know, a typical university license, our fast license program, and then sometimes we do licenses with startup companies and we and we, we, that's based on our fast license, but we might uh, uh, do it a little bit differently. So some of the terms will be the same, but some uh, might be a little bit different. So first of all, field of use. This is the areas the company is allowed to use the IP in. So this could be unlimited fields of use or it could be restricted. So Again, in life sciences, you might restrict it to human or animal applications, to a single disease condition. Uh, for more of a device, you might restrict it to oil field applications. Uh, in, in, at U of S, we most commonly 
uh, make it unlimited. And that's just, again, not wanting to haggle with the company, make it really friendly. We'll just give you all uses of the technology. The grant is what permission has actually been being given. So this could be an exclusive license or a non-exclusive license. If it's non-exclusive, it could be licensed to others as well. So an exclusive license is typically more valuable to a company because again, remember the whole point of access to a patent is it gives you a monopoly that allows you to exclude your competitors from, from using it. So most of the time, companies want exclusive licenses because that allows them to exclude their competitors from practicing the technology. And indeed, most of the time at USASC, we grant exclusive licenses. Though an important note is universities usually retain rights for research and teaching. So universities want to make sure that even after they've granted the license, they can continue to do research and teaching on that technology. They can't sell it, they can't have any commercial activities, but uh, research and teaching they can do. And that's very common, almost universal in uh, university licenses. Sublicense rights, this is whether the company can go on and license it to others. Um, so this, this varies in licenses. This can be uh, uh, no sublicense rights or, or yes, you can have sublicense rights, but, but you need the university's permission to sublicense it. Or it can be, uh, yes, you can sublicense it so long as you satisfy these conditions. Again, trying to be really friendly at USAS, we generally do give the company the ability to sublicense. Um, we say that the university doesn't have to provide consent. They just have to tell us. They have to tell us if, uh, if they've uh, done a sublicense. Territory, this is which countries the license is being given in. So you could imagine situations where, where you restrict this. Maybe you, you uh, license it to a European company in Europe and an American company in North America and a Chinese company in Asia and restrict it by territory like that. Again, being, being very friendly at uh, USASC, we tend to grant worldwide license, not all the time, but, but more often than not. The term, uh, usually the term for a, a patent license is expiry of the patent. So upon expiry of the patent, uh, there's no longer exclusivity. Anybody can use it at that, at that time, including uh, the the company that it was licensed to and the company at that point the agreement agreement would be dissolved and they wouldn't uh, owe anything back to the university uh, after the patent expires patent costs who pays for the patent costs um, typical for other universities as well as us we just don't have the budgets to deal with the the large patent costs uh, if you're doing a, a really broad strategy around the world so we generally ask that the company pays for all forward and backward patent costs. Now, where this starts to vary a little bit for startups is startups obviously don't have the resources that, um, that uh, uh, big companies have. So now we start to negotiate with the startup company. And a very common thing we might do is we might forgive the past patent costs and only ask the startup to pay uh, the moving forward patent costs. And, and our licensee is always uh, gets to make the decision on where we patent uh, and when. So um, they can, they're in full control of how broadly we patent. If they can't afford a territory, they, they basically can choose not to do it. So this is one of the things that starts to differ in a startup license from a license with a, a more established company. Okay, so now we're talking a little bit about what does the university get back. So something that's very common to get back is a universe, is a, a royalty on sales. It's usually a low single digit percentage. Um, we typically found that we would start negotiations at 5% and get whittled down to one or 2% after several months. So we made the decision to just say, hey, we're just gonna start at 1% final offer and we found that most companies are generally fairly uh, responsive to this because um, uh, they they need to be able to make money as well. They have a lot of investment to be made. Um, for example, in drug development, it can cost from the time a technology leaves the university to the time it reaches the market, it can be 10 or more years and cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So you might think that the technology is really important. It is, but there's a tremendous amount of work the vast majority of work still has to be completed after the inventive process. And that's why compensation is, is weighted so 
much towards the companies that are investing the, the hundreds of millions of dollars. You think about a university, they go out, they get grant funding, usually in the order of say, hundreds of thousands to a, a couple million. So that's maybe the university's investment in a technology. Getting to market still requires a hundred or more million dollars. So you see how the share of that value kind of reflects that. Sublicense compensation. So again, this is if if uh, um, if the the licensee decides to grant further licenses, we ask for a share back of that. Change of control. So this is if if a company is is bought, do they owe us any of that uh, transaction price? And you think about well-established companies, Fortune 500 companies, companies with market capitalizations in the billions. They have lots of different products, lots of different technologies. Uh, the university licenses one more technology for them. They get bought by an even bigger company. Well, does it make sense? Is, would it be fair for the university to get a percentage of that multi-billion dollar company based on providing only a single technology to it? Probably not. Um, so for typical university license, for a fast license, we generally don't ask for a chain of control percentage if we're dealing with a mature company. Uh, for a startup, on the other hand, uh, where it might only have a single technology in the company, and um, and uh, the university has provided that technology, the university has provided uh, a tremendous proportion of the early stage value of that company. So we generally do think it might be fair to ask for something extra. Uh, so, for example, if the startup gets bought, we we might ask for a low single digit percentage of that money to come back to the university. And this is something we typically negotiate over. Um, recall that we often negotiate on patent costs. We don't make the startup pay all the patent costs. And this is something that we might ask for in exchange for that. Because we might ask for, okay, we'll, we'll help you pay the patent costs, but if you guys are bought or sold, we want a little bit of the action. Uh, goals uh, or milestones are goals that must be achieved by the company to uh, keep the license. Uh, so these are, you know, reach this goal by this date or use the license or lose the license. So for drugs, it might be, um, you know, reach clinical trials or reach uh, a market within so many years. Uh, for devices, it might be uh, uh, reach certain scales of manufacturing. Um, we often found at the university is that our licensees were quite ambitious in their goals and are continually missing their milestones. Now, on one hand, that would allow us to yank the license back, but I don't think we've ever had a successful example of a license we've yanked away from a licensee and then been able to market, uh, find a new partner, and then be successful with that. One of the reasons is, remember, you got this 20-year patent life. That's ticking away as the company works on it. If they work on it for several years, um, you don't get that time back. So we generally find it it's much better to work with the original company you licensed to. And so we were continually renegotiating milestones over and over again. So again, being very friendly to industry, we just decided to eliminate milestones from our licenses. Uh, unless the company really wants them in there, we'll, we'll just have a very general milestone that they have to maintain activity. As long as they can demonstrate activity without a one year period of no activity, they get to keep the license. Upfront payments, uh, sometimes universities do ask for upfront payments. Typically they're very low or zero. If something is really hot, it could be in the tens of thousands or or it's, it's heard of, but very rare that you might have a, a $100,000 uh, upfront license fee. So you think about something like CRISPR when it was first invented, um, that's the gene editing technology that's been around. I don't know if it's maybe 10 years now, and uh, that was known at the time to be very hot. So the institutions that came up with that, maybe they could have asked for a very high upfront fee, but, but generally uh, you don't get very high upfront fees. And in fact, the philosophy we've had at the university uh, trying to be very friendly to our industry partners is why should they pay us money if they're not making money yet? They still have a lot of investment to make in the technology to bring it to market. So we've said that other than patent costs, you're not going to pay us a dime until you start to make money off the technology. And again, uh, a lot of companies uh, like that philosophy. Okay, so if you want to look in more detail at our, our FAST license, 
Um, you can jot down or try to memorize this long three-line website. Or if you just Google USASC Fast License, uh, you can find our webpage dedicated to it. And in particular, we have a simple uh, one-page term sheet that kind of summarizes the things we just talked about. So that's there for those that are interested in looking at it, particularly if you are thinking about a startup or licensing a, a university technology. Okay, so starting to wrap up now, uh, just wanting to go back to um, our uh, figure here about how we protect patents at the university. Again, start talking six months ahead of time, finalize that invention report about three months before uh, the invention is going to be publicly disclosed. Uh, we'll do a patentability and market assessment, work with the patent agent to get the uh, patent application drafted. We've got our two and a half years of protection. The university pays the costs. We try to find a, an industry partner before the patent costs start to get really high. And we use that licensing mechanism to transact that uh, technology to the company while uh, um, having the opportunity for the university and inventors to benefit financially if the invention is successful. So again, just winding down here, uh, I think what we talked about today will cover most situations, uh, particularly in, in uh, the countries that Canada most, most commonly does businesses with, but there will be some, some situations that don't fit precisely with what we talked about. So just some do's and don'ts at a university. Um, commercialization can be very exciting. It can be very compatible with the other uh, activities people take on at universities. Um, you can use commercialization to leverage research opportunities, collaborate with companies, um, obtain funding from companies, obtain funding from grant programs that, that require uh, industry collaborators. On the other hand, uh, there's probably some don'ts as well. Don't burn bridges. Uh, unless you are all in on doing the startup company, don't quit your day job. Um, and the thing to remember here, and you might think this is a bit of a pessimistic thing, 95%, maybe more than like 99% of inventions never earn a dime. And you might say, well, well, John, why the heck are we talking about this? Why are we doing this if, if so few inventions succeed? And, and I say, I try to flip this on his head, make it a bit of an optimistic thing. Think about all the tremendous things we have in the world that uh, make us safer, improve our lives, uh, medicines, vaccines, uh, um, telecommunication technology, airplanes and transportation technology, um, flat screen TVs, entertainment, all these tremendous, wonderful things that enrich our lives. All of these things are the 1% that succeeded. So the value that innovation and patents and commercialization provides to society, provides to all of us, whether we're involved in commercialization or not is tremendous. And, and that's why I think it is, it is well worth the efforts to, to participate in this. So with that, uh, I think we have a few minutes uh, uh, left here for questions, comments, or feedback. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, whether you have general high-level questions or maybe you have a, a question about a specific case, a specific potential invention, I'd be very happy to talk to you. Um, easiest way is probably firstname.lastname at, at usas.ca, John Mapletoff, um, but my uh, uh, phone and mobile numbers are there as well. So with that, I'll probably back out here, uh, stop sharing, and I'll see if there's any uh, questions or comments here for the last uh, few minutes. I just want to say thank you, John, for this uh, ex ex really, really excellent uh, overview. I I've, I'm an author and, and I learned quite a lot and I didn't realize that copyright actually starts almost as soon as I hit, you know, pen to paper more or less. So it, that, that, was a, that was an interesting learning for me. Um, I am going to stop the recording uh, and, and open things up for, for discussion and questions. But thank you very much, John, for being with us today. We much appreciate it. Yes, no problem.